Welcome to the next lecture in CSM 221 Basics of Physical Chemistry. In this lecture, you will be understanding how does some ions end up getting abnormal conductance. And followed by this fact, different applications of measurements of conductance and importantly, we will be taking a closer look at what are conductometric titrations. As always, I will be following the Glaston textbook and this will be the last part that is given in chapter 2. So let's have a quick recap of what we learned in the entire course of electrolysis. We started the first lecture by giving various definitions and also seeing simulations on how application of electrical energy results in migration of chemicals in electrolytes. And these were quantified by the Faraday's law. Followed by that, we uh, understood what is resistance and conductance and relating the conductivity that comes up as a union measure with respect to the current. And following that, the equivalent conductance for electrolytes were defined and how it could be determined at infinite dilution. We also understood what is the dependence of equivalent conductance on temperature, dielectric constant and valency. And followed by this, we also tried to map how do these ions end up migrating. And in this regard, the theory of independent migration of ions were put forth where the total conductance that emerges from a given salt is nothing but the sum of ionic conductance of the individual ions that are present. That may not, not always be a case where the lambda naught of the ions are already known. So in which case one can actually resort to another methodology where the stable salts could also be used for this uh, given electrolyte. And followed by this, we also took a look at what are ionic mobilities. And uh, with a simple deduction, we were able to realize that the ionic conductance are, is directly proportional only to the ionic mobility for a given equivalent of a substance when one volt per uh, centimeter of potential difference is uh, applied. And uh, various examples, we were able to see that this number ranges between 0 0.05 to 0 0.1 centimeter per second for various uh, cations and anions. Of course, this is not including something like uh, the H plus and OH minus, which we will see in greater detail today. Why do they have differences that come up uh, in their migration? And followed by that, similar to what was seen in the equivalent conductance as a function of temperature, the ionic conductance was also given such that the temperature coefficient, which is about 0.02, was also made to understand how and why does lambda naught keeps increasing as a function of temperature. And from this measurement, we were also able to see that the activation that comes up for ionic migration matches quite well for the viscosity of solution, indicating that something like the product of uh, lambda to eta would be a constant, which is what is the Walden's rule. Of course, we also saw the dependence of pressure that implicitly comes largely because of similar uh, relationship where the ions have to migrate in presence of the solvent. So let's carry on with what is abnormal conductance. And in this table, you are able to see various anions and cations that are put forth. And importantly, you are able to appreciate the fact that the conductance of H plus and OH minus are quite anomalous, meaning that they are quite different from what is otherwise seen. Not different in a small way, they are different between 2 to 4 fold, which is quite interesting. And if you are also able to therefore see the same thing from the equivalent conductance to the product of the viscosity, what are you are able to see is that H2O has a very high uh, product of viscosity to that of equivalent conductance of about 3 units, while the other ones are between 0.5 to 0.75 units. So this indicates that it potentially could be the H plus and OH minus have quite a number of differences that could end up coming, which results in their migrations being different in comparison to the other an anions and cations that are present. So let's take a closer look at it. Can such a behavior come only due to small size? This is quite interesting to think about it, largely because H plus is a bare proton that's going to be present because the only electron that's present in hydrogen atom is what is abstracted from this. So that results in a bare proton that is present and therefore could have a very, very small size since the small size would end up resulting in a higher velocity for a given energy. If you're thinking about kinetic energy of half mv square, if the kinetic energy is constant, if the mass is slow, then the velocity is higher. Although that seems like a very plausible reasoning and explanation for it, however, that is not true, largely because in the presence of water, the H plus ends up binding to water to form hydronium ion. And for this process, the delta G naught is far much more favorable, resulting in the fact that a bare proton cannot be present. So therefore, if one has to really compare the size of the hydronium ion to that of any other 
cation that is present, one would see that their sizes are quite similar, meaning that the size of hydronium ion is quite similar that of, to that of the sodium ion. However, the conductance of H3O plus to that of Na plus is about seven times different. If you take a look at the tables that were given to you earlier, you would be able to find this. Interestingly, the migration of H plus in other solvents, for instance, in acetone, nitrobenzene, nitromethane and ammonia is actually as same as of the sodium ion. So this indicates the fact that H plus ends up behaving quite differently in its own environment in, that is in water or on the other hand whenever you don't have an hydroxyl group that is present it ends up behaving same as sodium where one could actually say that the migration ends up coming due to the size. So therefore in addition to size all this data indicate that there must be an additional mechanism in which H plus finds a way to move much faster than any other ion that has been observed. So once again, we invoke the growthus like model of migration for H plus uh, ions. And interestingly, calculations indicate that the H plus ion should move only about 86 picometer when a potential difference of one volt per centimeter is applied. However, when one ends up measuring it electrolytically, we find that it moves about three and a half times more than what is anticipated. And what could this uh, be due to? So let's try to understand that in detail. So I'm first going to draw an H3O plus ion. Remember, there is still a lone pair that is present. So this is going to have a tetrahedral geometry. And let's assume you have another free water molecule that is present. So you're going to have H plus here and a lone pair. So what could end up happening? The electrons could come here such that the proton from the hydronium ion, which is the H3O plus, could easily be abstracted by the next one. So therefore, you end up having something of this sort. It's important to notice here what ended up happening. The H plus that's present in this far end actually ends up reaching much farther. So meaning that if you have to understand here, it is about one, two, three, four bonds that end up moving. And you're able to realize that accounts for about three and a half times more of course, this is not very easy. If you want to end up writing another OH2 molecule, one can actually keep having the relay mechanism such that the lone pair of the electron keeps abstracting so that the H plus ends up moving much, much farther in a much shorter period of time for a given potential difference that's applied. However, one also has to Understand here, if another H plus has to come, this given water molecule cannot take it right away. And therefore, a rotation has to end up happening such that the orientation is appropriate such that further migration can happen. So therefore, the jumping of protons between the nearby solvents followed by the rotation for this molecule ends up facilitating the movement of H plus, which is much more faster than what would otherwise be achieved for a given ion. So similar uh, phenomenon for H plus in solvents is also observed for hydroxyl groups. For instance, if you're talking about something like an alcohol, the same thing would end up happening. Wherever there are hydroxyl groups present, the migration of H plus could have a relay type mechanism, which is what we call as a growth as like mechanism that helps in aiding it to move much faster. But remember one thing, the rotation that follows for something like an organic alcohol group would be hindered by the size of the alkyl groups that are present, meaning that the rotation that has to happen followed by the passing of the proton to the nearby solvent has to be accompanied by the rotation that ends up coming. And as the size of the alkyl group keeps increasing, this rotation also would require energy such that it can end up successfully achieving it. So one could anticipate that such anomalous behavior for hydroxyl groups containing solvents, for instance, alcohols would end up being slower and slower as the alkyl group keeps increasing. So now we can also ask a question, why would hydroxyl ion in addition to H plus also have such anomalous behavior? So you have a O minus with a H. On the other hand, you have H to O. So this ends up coming such that one is able to see how fast it can end up moving. So similar by the logic that I said here, what you're able to understand is that the movement is only about two times, which is why unlike the H+, plus, which has about a 3.5 times more, here it's about 1.8 times more is what uh, one effectively ends up seeing. So if with this were the mechanism, then what would end up happening is that RO- minus would also show a similar behavior. Interestingly enough, this has not been observed, which once again indicates that the growth as type 
uh, migration of OH- is also not all that common. And for instance, if you take a look at something like uh, uh, CH3O- or C2H5O-, their conductance is very similar to that of Cl-. What ends up happening here is that this indicates the fact that the RO- does not have a growth as type mechanism. So therefore, only in cases where you have self-ionized solvents, meaning that ROH in its neat solution could have anomalous behavior for something like RO-, but the moment you are having RO- in something like H2O, the migration of this is not going to end up being anomalous anymore. Okay, so the, there are exceptions do exist, but of course, exception is what forms the rule. So this is not surprising. Go take a look at why H2SO4 behaves in a different way. Of course, we are talking about neat H2SO4 solution or solvent here. Okay, then now that we have understood H plus and OH minus have their own intricate differences that come in their migration. Therefore, this ends up playing havoc whenever you have water and trace amounts in other solvents. Meaning that if you are trying to have something like a migration of OH- in ROH, meaning in alcohol, and you have H2O that's going to be present, what it will end up doing is to influence the migration intermediate to that of whatever is observed in the alcohol by itself and water that is present. But generally, when for most of the cases, when you're talking a strong electrolyte, so something like NaCl in alcoholic uh, solvents, is that addition of water only influences in terms of the viscosity, as you might remember from the Walden's rule, the product of con conductance to that of uh, eta is a constant. So therefore, if eta changes, conductance is going to change. So if we are taking a look at other cases where you're looking at the H plus migration in other solvents, for instance, H2SO4 in an alcohol solvent, then there is an initial decrease that comes up due to the small addition of water. This happens largely because if the H plus has to migrate in ROH condition, one could once again envisage a situation where a growth as type mechanism is indeed feasible. So meaning that this ends up coming here, this ends up coming here and so on and so forth. So the H plus at the end would be able to migrate much faster. However, the moment you add water to the solution, the H plus becomes H3O plus, which cannot have a growth as type movement within the alcohol condition and therefore this ends up reducing it initially of course as more and more water starts to come the behavior starts to become more growthless like so as i said more addition of water results in h3o plus migrating and therefore results in increase in conductance back now when such a measurement is done for h3o plus in alcohol it's quite interesting to see that its conductance is very very similar to that of the sodium ion indicating the fact if you might remember some time back we said the size of h3o plus is same that of na plus and that we are able to see in an alcohol condition and this is not holding good in water largely because an additional type of mechanism which is different that is just based on size ends up coming Thus, it makes it obvious that the motion of H3O plus in water versus other solvents is different, plausibly due to growth as like mechanism. So how can we use the measurement of uh, conductance is that one can actually measure the solubility product of sparingly soluble salts. What's a solubility product? Basically, when you're having Ma that's a solid and if you're trying to dissolve it in water, it's going to be in equilibrium with Ma in aqueous solution. And Depending upon how much it's soluble, this, this is called the solubility product, you're going to have something like how much ever is soluble in water divided by the total amount of solid that was provided. So this is called solubility product. And one would like to measure it for sparingly soluble salts and there are many different ways of doing it. But one way of doing it is by using this conductance measurements. And such a measurement comes up with a bunch of hypotheses where the solute in this case, M and A are expected to dissociate as M plus and A minus and nothing more complicated ends up happening. And subsequently, you're going to understand that the solubility of such sparingly soluble salt is assumed to be low enough such that one can estimate the conductance at that concentration and approximate it to the conductance at infinite dilution of such salts. And most importantly, this type of an approach assumes complete dissociations at concentrations where it's sparingly soluble, meaning that you cannot have uh, a degree of dissociation of 50% and expect it to give proper measurements from conductance. So what do we mean by this? Let's start from whatever we learned earlier. 
lambda is going to be given by 1000 times kappa over c and in this situation you are going to substitute c to s where s is the uh, solubility of it and given equivalence per liter and lambda is going to be estimated as lambda naught and kappa is something what you will end up measuring in an experiment in a conductometric experiment meaning that you will once again remind yourself that you'll have two electrodes you'll have the solution which has the saturated concentration of the sparingly soluble salt the distance between the electrodes is one centimeter and the electrolyte ends up occupying one centimeter square area and therefore in this case measuring current would give you the proxy for conductivity and therefore one can use this so therefore if you rearrange this equation you're going to get 1000 times kappa divided by the lambda naught and the lambda naught could be estimated from lambda naught of each of the ions so once one ends up getting this approximated solubility can be determined directly so let's take a look at an example for a situation where cold rush ended up measuring such things for agcl at 25 degrees celsius and his measurement showed that for agcl in water it's about 3.41 times 10 power 6 semen per centimeter and one has to be careful in such measurements so if you might remember in previous lectures i said the conductivity of water should also be carefully measured so that it can be deducted from whatever ends up coming so this is what one calls as the background and in order to subtract the background one has to measure it so the moment you end up getting it one can actually get the conductivity of kgcl which is determined by the difference of 3.14 to 1.6 times 10 power minus 6 semen per centimeter. Once you have determined what is conductivity of AGCL, the next thing is to determine what is the equivalent conductance of AGCL at infinite dilution. As we had approximated earlier, it will be the sum of the independent migrations of AG plus and CL minus. Go, please go take a look at the tables that were shown in the earlier class. Then you would be able to see this ends up coming as 138.26 semen centimeter squared. Once one ends up determining what is uh, lambda naught and kappa is determined by this. So 1000 times kappa divided by lambda naught would give you the value. And for this case, if you take a look, you end up measuring as 1.31 10 power 5 minus 5 equivalent per liter, which is like normality which agrees very well with measurements that were done by cold rush at 25 degrees by other independent methods. So such measurements also end up giving an idea of degree of dissociation. If you might remember a moment earlier, I said that the degree of dis uh, dissociation is assumed to be of the sort of complete dissociation, meaning that 100% dissociation is what was expected. On the other hand, if you are having a near 100% dissociation, Measuring sparing solubility using conductance method and some other method would help you in deciphering what is the degree of dissociation. For instance, same for AGCL, when the conductance measurements were done, one gets something like at 18 degrees Celsius, one gets something like 1.28 10 power minus 2. Realize from 25 degrees Celsius to 18 degrees Celsius, the degree, the degree of solubility reduces. Of course, as you keep increasing temperature, the level of solubility will be more. Remind yourself of supersaturated solutions where you can heat it and dissolve more than whatever is possible. Interestingly, when a similar measurement is done for the same solution using other methods, one gets 1.32 into 10 power minus 2 equivalent per liter. Of course, I think there is some small mistake in the way I have written it. Uh, maybe the power is not correct. But anyways, it suffices to say that if you do 1.28 divided on 1.32, assuming that this method ends up measuring accurately what is a, a sparing solubility and the conductance measurement gives you 1.28, one is able to realize there is about 97 percentage dissociation of AgCl into Ag plus and Cl minus ion while the remaining 3% remains as AGCL itself or some other species that does not conduct electricity. Okay, so therefore, thus, uh, if the sparing, sparing this soluble salt does not undergo 100% dissociation, then the conductance measurements will not be accurate. And for an example, you have something like lanthanum oxalate, where the measured value for conductance is 6 0.7 times into 10 power minus 7 equivalents per liter. On the other hand, when other measurement ends up coming, it's like 22.2 10 power minus 6 equivalents per liter, which indicates the fact that there is about only one third of ions that end up conducting. Although it's very tempting to interpret all of it in the degree of dissociation, one actually knows for lanthanum oxalate that there are other complex ions that are formed, which results in lack of migration. Good. So in addition to one such 
application of conductance to determine solubility of a sparingly soluble salt, one can also determine basicity of weak acids. This was empirically derived by Ostwald back in 1906, where he was able to show that conductance that is measured for a given solution at 32 times dilution from one equivalent and 1024 times dilution from one equivalent nicely corresponds to the basicity. Basically, it is proportional to basicity and the proportionality constant is 11. And this is an interesting thing to uh, think about. Why did he choose these dilutions? Is because the moment you make one equivalent per liter, it's easy to dilute it into half. And then you, you can keep on serially diluting it. If you dilute it five times, then you have 32 times dilution. And if you dilute it five more times, basically you're going to get 1024 dilution. So you start with one solution, dilute it five times, make a measurement, dilute it five more times with uh, the solvent, you get lambda. 1024 difference of measurement from lambda 1024 and lambda 32 gives you a certain number from which basicity could be determined so this is a nice example that is shown where you have pyridine carboxylic acid cooh where as you serially in, in the, uh, include this is one and two i think um, as you clearly include more and more carb carboxylic acid, the acidity keeps increasing. And nicely what you are able to see that the measurements for lambda 10, 24 and 32, the difference nicely comes up as close to 11, 22, 33, 44 and 55. Th this is one application of uh, such a measurement. There are also fallacies of it when you have a very weak acid where the dissociation does not end up happening. This empirical rule doesn't hold good. One can also use the same principle to measure other parameters. For instance, if you are having a platinum coordination complex, one always comes up into doubt on whether the chloride is coordinating with the platinum or is actually freely present in the solution. Thankfully, if the chloride is freely present in solution, it helps in conductance. On the other hand, if it is caught within the coordination compound, it is not available for conducting the electricity. So one can actually exploit the fact that for most ions, the equivalent ionic conductance is around 60 Siemens centimeter square for most of it. So therefore, if you are taking an example of equivalent conductance, then one can actually determine what is molar conductance. Molar conductance is nothing but equivalent conductance multiplied by the number of equivalents that are present. And in the previous lecture, we did see how the definition of various concentrations comes up, especially in normality, where we define what is an equivalence. So for therefore, for an uni-uni electrolyte, for instance, KCl, you are going to have contribution from K and Cl that ends up coming. So 60 plus 60, which is 1 plus 1 times 60, gives you 120 Siemens centimeter square. On the other hand, if you are having a uni-bi or a bi-uni electrolyte, you for let's take an example, K2SO4, you are going to have twice of that of uh, K2, and one of SO4 2 minus and half of SO4 2 minus is about 60. So therefore, two of that will be 120 plus 120. So you're going to get 240. Similarly, one can calculate for unitri, which will be about 360 Siemens centimeter square, uni tetra, tetra uni about 480. The same number will be for bye bye as well. So if you sit and calculate, you'll be able to get these. So let's take an example of the platinum complexes. In the first example, you are able to see as we have written it, four of the ammonia molecules end up coordinating while the two of the chloride ions are counter ions and therefore available for conduction. In the second part, you are able to see three of the ammonia are in, are in coordination. One chloride ends up being coordinated to platinum while only one chloride is available. In this example, no chloride ions are available for migration. And in this example, although chloride ions are coordinated, potassium ends up resulting in conduction. In the last case, two potassiums are present. So basically, you might end up uh, looking at something like bi-uni type of conductance here. And in this case, it is going to be something like uni-uni. this case, there will be no conduction. And then when you are having something like this, this is going to be a uni-uni electrolyte again. And the last one is going to be bi-uni type example. Okay, so this being the case, let's take a look at it. This is how the predictions go. We have bi uni 240 as we just saw a moment earlier same for this and since these are uni uni you'll have 120 
and for the middle one you're going to expect zero and these are the measured values of molar conductance and you're nicely able to see how these values are very very close and therefore one can actually say how many chloride ions are available for uh, in the solution versus the one that is coordinated okay now to the final application of conductance now that we are able to see each of the ion has its own conductance and the total conductance is given by the summation of the conductance of individual ions that are present with their uh, respective equivalence here. So what we can try to do is to actually have titration experiments done so that one can also measure of how much concentration of a given acid or base is there using conductance. So let's try to plot conductance as a function of titrant concentration. Let's take an example as well. If you're trying to have HCl in your solution and you're adding a strong base to this, which is NaOH, so you're going to result in the formation of NaCl plus H2O. And the important point that you got to make a note of here is that as you have excess of H2O, it's not, although it could have anomalous behavior, but you're going to have a large excess of H2O, meaning that the addition of this is not going to change the conduction of water as much in the bulk. But on the other hand, what you're going to have is that you initially had, this is where you started with, you have conductance that comes due to H plus and conductance that comes due to Cl minus. And you're replacing it with NaCl, which means that you're going to get conductance from Na plus and conductance from Cl minus. And just a moment earlier, we saw that the conductance, anomalous conductance of H plus in comparison to any other ion, therefore you are substituting with the lesser conducting ion. So therefore, if you keep adding more of the titrant, which is NaOH, what is going to happen is that the conductance keeps reducing. It keeps reducing until the time all of the HCl gets neutralized. And the moment all of the HCl gets neutralized from there on, any addition of NaOH is going to result in lambda naught of Na plus and lambda naught of OH minus, which is strongly conducting, both of which will conduct and therefore you're going to get an increase that comes. Of course, the slope of the curves are going to be different because previously you started with H plus and Cl minus and at the end of it, you're going to be, the Cl minus won't contribute because the total number of Cl minus would remain constant. But on the other hand, you are actually adding Na plus and OH minus at the end of it, which results in a different slope. So if one is able to fit these two curves, we would be able to figure what is the end point and therefore one would be actually be able to determine the concentration of the strong acid. Remember one thing, the strong base that is being added here should be available in highest of concentration. This is largely because any volume changes that comes up upon addition of titrant should be accounted for. And therefore, if you're using a very concentrated strong base, there is a very minimal volume change that comes and therefore it helps you do the calculations easier. On the other hand, if you do not have the opportunity to use a very strong base, remember addition of strong acid to strong base is an extremely exothermic reaction and one has to have safety considerations in place. So therefore, if you're using a less concentrated strong base, one has to account for volume changes that come in order to take care of this. So the next example that we'll be taking a look at will be the titration of strong acid as a function of weak base. Similarly, we'll be plotting lambda as a function of titrant concentration. And in this case, remember, let's say you're starting with HCl and you're neutralizing it with a weak base. Let's call it something like uh, B minus. What is going to end up happening here is that it's going to form HP plus Cl minus. So what this is going to result in is same reduction as you will able to be able to see as what you saw for the uh, strong acid and strong base. However, upon reaching the neutralization reaction, since you are adding a weak base, what it would end up doing is that it would have very, very small changes that would come up after the end point. Similarly, fitting this curve and this curve to straight lines, one would be able to determine what is the end point. Now, let's take an example of how does a weak acid like CH3COOH behaves with a strong base like NaOH. In this case, when you're starting out, the lambda is going to be determined right concentration of any over here so when you're starting here what this is going to result in it's going to form ch3coo minus plus na plus plus h2o the initial migration is due to the acetate ion and the h plus ion that is present 
and that we are substituting with the acetate ion that is being present so meaning that this doesn't end up changing on the other hand the na plus is what ends up coming but more importantly what ends up happening is that since this will be more dissociated than that of the acetic acid this results in the common ion effect meaning that when you have the same ion that is being present due to le chatelier's principle the dissociation of acoh to aco minus and h plus ends up going more to the reverse direction than the forward direction because you have excess of aco minus that comes up following the titration so therefore in this case a slight tiny bit reduction and of course as the concentration of naoh increases it's going to be going on increasing and at the moment that you have added excess of base than what is required you're going to have a higher slope that ends up coming because the moment all of the concentration of the weak acid is done then all migration is going to be due to naoh and therefore which is much more than the weak acid so therefore one has to fit this carefully such that the change that ends up coming here would provide you the end point of this given conductometric titration the last example here would be that of the weak acid and weak base here also one might end up seeing small differences that come up as we just saw a moment earlier that is the reduction of conductance as a function of the triton being added initially but that is not going to be as appreciable it's going to be much smaller and then the change is going to go the same way for the same reasons that we discussed but upon reaching the conclusion of the titration since you're adding a weak base which will not dissociate as much you're not going to have a more stronger curve that ends up coming so this is what you get in the titration of weak acids with a strong base this is what you get for a weak base then one might ask which is a better experiment to do it's much more easier to determine the slope for the weak base titration than the strong base titration so therefore one would actually prefer to titrate a weak acid with a weak base than with a strong base so finally what is the advantage that this ends up offering is that one can actually make the titration of mixture of strong and say weak acids that are present in the same solution so for instance if you are titrating it against a weak base for instance like ammonia or something let's say b minus very similar to what was studied a little earlier as you keep adding b minus initially hcl will get neutralized since you are quenching h plus what you end up seeing is a reduction of conductance that would end up happening upon reaching the end point what you're going to get is the minimum conductance that you would end up measuring for that example and as you add more and more of the base what you what you're going to get once again is that you're going to get ch3coo minus plus hb is what you're going to get the con the conductance is going to increase to a certain point once you have neutralized all the weak acid that's going to be present further addition of the weak base is not going to contribute as much it doesn't dissociate very easily to the uh, constituent ion so therefore you're going to get something like this the fitting each of the curve would tell you what was the neutralization point and based on the equivalence of each of the base and the acid that you're looking at one can actually determine what are the end points we will solve a few problems based on this so as to understand these concepts another example of where conductometric titrations are helpful is in displacement reactions so for instance if you're doing a titration of the salt of a weak acid so let's take ch3coona and that of a strong acid we can take hcl you're going to get something like ch3cooh and nacl which is na plus plus cl minus that can be that will be present in this reaction the highly ionized sodium acetate this will be highly ionized because it will be happy as ch3co minus and na plus is going to be replaced by na plus and cl minus so remember one thing the chloride ion ends up having a higher migration than that of the ch3co minus please go back to previous lecture take a look at the tables where the mi the migration tendencies for these two are given you would see that the lambda for cl minus is greater so therefore what you end up measuring is that conductance as a function of hcl that is added to this weak acid you're going to have increase that's going to come up 
in terms of conductance largely because lambda of cl minus is greater than that of lambda of ch3co minus but the moment all of the ch3co na has been converted to ch3coh what's going to happen is that you're going to add more and more hcl so therefore you're going to have a steep increase that comes up in conductance so therefore fitting these two lines would help you determine where you end up having the end point of such a dissociation for a weak acid so similarly one can also apply the same concept for precipitation reactions for instance if you're trying to have a kcl solution and you are trying to determine how much of it is present one can actually invoke the concept that if you add a silver chloride salt it will end up precipitating agcl which will not be ionized or not appreciably ionized and form the counter ions so in this example what you are able to see is that you started with a certain conductance and you are actually equally giving it uh, with some other ions that you are supplying with so as you keep starting what will end up happening is that you will not have much of a change in conductance that will come up with the addition of AgNO3. But the moment you have reached the end point, you are going to have an increase that comes up in excess addition of AgNO3. Fitting these two curves once again will give you the end point for such a precipitation. On the other hand, if you are having another example where both of the salts that you are titrating are sparingly soluble, so this is an example I'm taking from the textbook where you're titrating magnesium sulfate with barium hydroxide. You end up getting magnesium hydroxide and barium sulfate. In this example, both end up precipitating and therefore what ends up happening for a similar curve is that you'll have conductance as a function of BASO4 concentration. It's going to keep reducing until a point when it ends up reaching the end point and then it starts increasing. So therefore, one has to realize that application of conductance measurements is super helpful towards different types of titration, in particular getting the concentrations of strong weak acids and bases and also getting a mixture of say acids or bases and also determining the degree of dissociation in terms of displacement reactions for weak acids and weak bases and precipitation reactions as shown here. So with this, we come to the end of the electrolysis section of this entire course. So we should be very happy about it. And in the subsequent lectures, we'll be taking a look at what are the basic things that we can learn from kinetics. Thank you very much.